We're going to be straight ahead with a few questions. Are we doing enough testing? Simple question, but the answer is a bit complicated when you dig into the data and we're going to get to the bottom of it. Plus, you asked what's up with the antigen testing that is new. A doctor is going to explain how that's different. And this weekend, we got a lot of questions from you about the stimulus payments. Well, it turns out there is a big deadline that's creeping up fast. But first, in case you're just joining us, the three things you need to know right now. Number one, part of our region will begin phase one of reopening this Friday. The governor made it official this morning. The Finger Lakes region, which includes Orleans, Genesee and Wyoming counties, has met all seven criteria. The Western New York region, which includes Erie, Niagara, Allegheny, Cattaraugus and Chautauqua counties, is right now is only meeting five of those seven. Number two, we are still not where we need to be when it comes to hospitalizations, but starting today, we should finally get to see the data for ourselves. Our Dave McKinley asked the governor if the state health department will release that information and we're told it should soon show up online. And number three, we learned today that the number of deaths in Erie County has risen to 370. Now that's the other benchmark that needs to go down in order for this region to reopen. More than a third of the deaths are coming in nursing homes. 41 of those just from one facility, Father Baker Manor in Orchard Park. Let's get to it. Our first question and so much of the focus right now is on reopening Western New York. Whether you think now is the right time or not, what happens over the coming weeks will affect all of us. Now, naturally, a lot of your questions have focused on the seven metrics laid out by the governor. These are the requirements for each region to enter phase one of reopening. And here at 530, we want to focus on testing, which you can see is highlighted there. The standard is 30 tests per 1000 residents per month. So divide that by 30 days in a month and you basically get one test per 1000 uh, 1000 uh, people being tested per day. Uh, that's kind of what you need in order to hit that. So what we're doing is kind of graphing this out. The red dotted line is the requirement 1400 daily tests in our five counties. And if you look there, it appears that Western New York was where we needed to be. The blue dotted line is really important. That is the seven day rolling average. And over the past week, we have been right around that benchmark, the number of tests needed. But look at yesterday, a sharp decline in testing, and that could bring down the average. Could that hurt Western New York's chances at reopening? Well, we asked Erie County Executive Mark Polencars this afternoon. I think a lot had to do with the, with the weekend. Uh, I don't know exactly if the data that's on there today was listed for Sunday or if it was for Saturday, but I do know that on average, the test numbers go down on Saturday and Sunday just because there's less testing. In general, uh, the testing on the weekend is pre predominantly being done by hospitals. Uh, the individuals who come in and they may be at risk for COVID-19. Uh, a lot of the other sites are not open on the weekend. And uh, thanks, Mark, if, if I may add. Yes. Um, many times on Monday mornings, there seems to be a, like a little bit of backlog with the eclair system reporting out the data. So, and then on all of a sudden on uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we get these huge numbers. So, you know, again, these are reported tests, not the actual tests that were done. So, you know, we'll have to, that's why we'd like to look at the data by week, not necessarily by day, because there can be a backlog with the eclairs reporting. So to the doctor's point there, we'll see what happens in a couple of days, but our region is just so close to that standard that you have to meet 1400 a day. If we have weekends where we're testing here in Erie County yesterday, fewer than 400 people, that's going to bring that average down. And so I think it's a, a real serious question right now as to whether or not we can maintain that level needed to pass that metric. That's for sure. And I'm sure the county executive is keeping a close eye on it. He mentioned several times today that he was as anxious as everyone else is about yeah. reopening Western New York. And you know, if need be, and they need to do more weekend testing, I mean, certainly the facilities are all on board, whether it's all the various Kaleida sites or the local hospitals that, you know, want to be able to hit that number as well. So we may see increased opportunities if Monday through Friday isn't cutting it. Yeah, and we'll see how many testing, you know, how many people can be tested today, tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, because if you can bump that up enough to cover for the low test counts on the weekends, then we'll be fine.
So we'll right. keep following that. Uh, one of the big issues that's really been dominating headlines over the past few days has been this mystery inflammatory illness showing up in dozens of kids in New York City and dozens more in about 10 states around the country. Doctors are referring to it as pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome. The big question that we're getting from you is, are there any cases here locally? Well, today we got another update from Oshai Children's Hospital here in Buffalo. And we are told there are still no confirmed cases there. Last week we reported how doctors were going to look back at the medical records of children who had already been discharged prior to the outbreak here to see if maybe they had this inflammatory syndrome. Today, Oshai's chief medical officer said dating back to March 1st, only one patient who tested positive for COVID-19 had some of the symptoms of PMSIS, but they were mild and did not include shock. So it is unlikely that child actually had this syndrome. So really good news there, Michael. Yeah, and something that they are continuing to follow very closely. All the hospitals across the state are now um, required to report this stuff to the state. Um, they're really trying to get to the bottom of this because there is still a lot of mystery surrounding this illness. Yeah, very true. And we thought our children were somewhat immune, yeah. but appears not to be the case. Alrighty, on to our next question. We have diagnostic testing, antibody testing, and now antigen testing. Can you kindly explain what the new type of test is for? Sure thing. And who better than NBC chief medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. The FDA has now granted emergency use authorization for the very first antigen test. But how is this different from what's already out there? Well, antigen tests only take about 15 minutes and it's usually done with a nasal swab that can tell you if you still have the virus while it's active in your body. The other diagnostic test, it's been in use for some time now and it's called a PCR test. That usually needs to go to a lab and can take hours or days to get the results. So one of the big advantages of this new antigen test is the speed of the test, meaning more people can be tested in a quicker time frame. And as more people are tested, we can better identify infection rates closer to real time. The third test you might have heard about, the antibody test, but it's not a diagnostic test. It tells you if you've already had the virus and may now have some protection from getting it again. But remember, the antigen test tells you if you have it right now. So if you do test positive, you'll need to go into isolation right away. All three of these tests are critical in the fight against the virus. One of the really frustrating things early on was that it took so long to get test results. So the fact that you can get them in 15 minutes really is kind of a game changer. That's right. Before they had to go to a laboratory and it took several days. Meanwhile, I mean, you could potentially infect other people. So the speed and then again, being able to know and understand and be able to track that infection rate is really the key to staying one step ahead, not just keeping up with the virus, but getting in front of it. Yeah, another one of those important advancements that mm -hmm. keep happening, thank goodness. So uh, we try to keep track of which questions you ask us about the most, and it seems over the weekend that a lot of you wanted to have this update on stimulus checks. Now we reported on Friday that the majority of them have gone out, but some 20 million Americans are still waiting on this payment from the government. And now we have another update for you. If you don't want to wait for a check to arrive by mail, which obviously takes longer, you only have until this Wednesday at noon to give the IRS your bank information. Now, after that, you'll have to wait on the paper check and the government can only print about 5 million of those per week. So it will take some time to get all of them in the mail. If you want to give the government your direct deposit banking information, you go to irs.gov and you'll see right there on the homepage the Get My Payment tool. It's the same thing that you would use to check the status of your stimulus payment. It's pretty simple, but remember this data is only updated once per day overnight. So the IRS says there's no sense in going to that website and clicking on it multiple times a day. They do it once a day if you're looking for that information. But Wednesday at noon, um, they really are encouraging people. If you um, don't have direct deposit if you haven't given that information to the government, either through your tax return or maybe you're on Social Security and how you get your payment. Uh, it's going to come to you so much faster if you just input that info online. That's right. And you just don't want to wait. But it's interesting, Michael, how we're finding out 
the speed at which the government works. For some people, it's a revelation that, you know, they're not quite as proficient, let's say, in some of the computer programming that they use and making changes and getting things out to us as quickly as we've all become accustomed to in the private sector. Yeah, you think so. everything is just instant. They've been pretty fast yeah. with the direct deposits and then, right. and then actually mailing checks, you know, it just takes a lot longer. Yeah, in other areas, our state even is <laughs> woefully behind. Yeah. Anyway, well, speaking of common questions, we've been wanting to get back to this one for a while. Somebody texted us, what is the most likely way that someone with coronavirus got it? With the help of our very talented graphics folks, we have this simple explanation on how the virus that causes COVID-19 is actually spread. You can catch the coronavirus from a contaminated surface or from being close to another person. But public health experts worry about one more than the other. Person-to-person -person contact spreads the virus more easily and it's harder to prevent. Both of these risks start at the same place, inside the nose of an infected person. The virus tricks the human body into making new copies of itself, and those copies catch a ride out in tiny particles in your breath. Just calmly breathing or talking, this person emits particles that can carry the virus. You've seen these if you've ever breathed onto a cold window. If we zoom in on the kind of droplet that can come out of this person's mouth, you'd find a bunch of copies of the virus floating inside. The amount of viral particles in droplets is called the viral load. The more virus that gets into your body, the more likely it is to infect you. The droplets can linger in the air or scatter all over the place during a sneeze. <coughs> but for you to get infected from touching that, a lot of stuff has to go wrong. You'd have to touch it soon enough that the virus hasn't died, which can be hours or as much as a few days, depending on the surface. Then you'd have to touch your own face somewhere and let those copies of the virus in. But you also have a second chance to wash with soap or sanitize before that happens. But you get no second chances with person-to-person -person spread. <coughs> if droplets come out and you're close enough that they get in, that's the ball game. Most health experts think you should give people at least six feet to avoid that. More is better <coughs> because sneezes and coughs can shoot droplets much farther than that. You can also help nip this risk by leaving your house prepared. Face coverings can trap your droplets so they don't reach other people. 